everyone, I'm John Evans, and welcome to another episode of One on One. You may have sat right next to Webb Simpson at a coffee shop in Wilmington, or had a table right next to his at a restaurant at the beach and not even known it. Webb and his family come to the coast fairly often, but he's not one of the high-profile members of the professional golf tour like Tiger or Rory or Phil, but in his time as a golf pro, he's won five championships, including a major, and he's won more than $31.5 million in prize money. His personal life is just as good. Webb and his wife Dowd have five beautiful children, but there is someone else in their lives, and Webb credits him with playing the biggest role in the success he's had on and off the golf course. James Frederick Webb Simpson, professional golfer, championship winner, father and husband, welcome to the One on One with John Evans podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me on, John. I saw you post on Twitter a while back, Webb, and you said you were with your wife in a picture, and it said, at my favorite place in the world, figure eight, with my favorite person in the world, Dowd. <laughs> what makes figure eight and the new Hanover County coast so special to Webb Simpson? I just have so many memories there. I grew up going there every summer. Uh, my dad loved it down there. My mom loves it down there. And that's where I learned the game of golf. I learned when I was eight years old at Landfall um, how to play the game. And, um, you know, every year about, april uh, i get the itch to get back down there get on the boat and get out on the water so i, I just have so many memories there and, and just love it there and i know that you grew up in raleigh but how did wilmington and specifically landfall come to play that bigger role in your development as a golfer well my dad is has been he was in residential real estate for 40 years and so when landfall is beginning to develop he thought it'd be cool to you know build a house there lots were cheap and so he and my mom built a house and that's when we started going down there um you know for four to six weeks every summer and our house was right on the putting green of the die course so i'd just kind of wander over there with my dad and hang out and um yeah once i started playing i fell in love with it and i couldn't get enough of it well i didn't know that your house was there at the putting green I, i'm glad i didn't uh shank a, a pitching wedge or something coming into that 18th green over there i'm glad i didn't make any indentations in the simpson house yeah no you'd have been fine you might have hit somebody by the pool but we, we, we would have been okay do you remember when when you picked up your first golf club web i don't remember exactly when i picked up my first club i remember drew pearson who used to work there at landfall he made my first set of golf clubs and uh there was a kid by the name of kevin larson who went on to play at georgia tech uh in college, he kind of got me excited about golf because he was a year older and he was already really good and developed as a player. And he let me kind of hang out with him for a week. And that's that was kind of the week when I started playing a lot of golf. And did it get to a point where it was fun and then you realized, hey, I'm pretty good at this? Uh, yeah, I feel like I didn't care that much about being good at the beginning but then i realized okay the point of golf is to shoot a low score and so once everything was once i was learning everything and it started to click and i realized that you know birdies matter and pars matter and all that um i started taking it pretty serious and my dad kind of slowly got me into tournaments we didn't rush into it and you know once once i was probably 10 or 11 i started playing a tournament every quarter it seemed like and you know every year it kind of picked up from there and was there a point where you may have thought ah this is too hard this is too much work and and maybe game close to giving it up no i never did i mean golf i always enjoyed golf you know i played basketball and tennis when i had to work on those sports it felt like real work but golf hitting balls putting chipping all that seemed fun to me still so I slowly kind of quit playing the other sports as I got into my teenage years. And you had a lot of high school accolades. I mean, number one junior golfer. And, you know, for for somebody who's maybe in college, that's kind of fun and pressure. But did you ever feel any of the pressure as a teenager 
when you were starting to get better and starting to make a name for yourself and doing well in some of these tournaments? Well, yeah, absolutely. The pressure definitely grew, but the good kind of pressure. Um, and it was something that I needed to get used to, people paying attention to me, coming to watch me play. And that just prepared me for college, prepared me for pro golf. Because uh, as you know, you know, there's tens of thousands of people every week watching us play. And so I think the added pressure was a good thing. I think it kept me hungry, kept me working hard, kept me uh, focused on, you know, that next level of, you know, tournament play. When, when you're winning local tournaments, it's one thing, but then you got state tournaments, nationwide tournaments, and then world tournaments. So it, I think it, uh, the pressure was good for me. I have a lot of people know that you went to Wake Forest on the Palmer Scholarship. I don't know if many of them know that you studied religion there and that you have a very deep faith. Where did that come from? Well, I grew up going to, you know, my parents went to church every Sunday, and um, I just kind of assumed I was a Christian based on being familiar with it. But uh, one day somebody said something to me that hit home that, hey, I know a lot about uh, the president but I don't know him. And that was kind of my state as a, you know, so-called Christian. I knew a lot about the faith and a lot about Jesus, but I didn't actually know him um, personally uh, as my Lord and Savior. So when I went to Wake, um, I kind of dove into, you know, trying to figure out more what it is I said I'd always believed. Um, And then I I would say my faith took off my senior year of college where uh, I felt like I really— wanted to pursue a relationship with with jesus and not just you know claim christianity as my religion but actually um you know claim the relationship uh with jesus instead of a religion and so uh yeah that's kind of base for me for everything uh it affects my family it affects my work it affects life every day um so yeah that was senior year was kind of the turning point for me in faith and, and as the more I read up, and, and of course, being a lover of the game myself, I've, I've known Webb Simpson, and I, I knew your tie into southeastern North Carolina, but it, it really has impressed me, the more I read about you, Webb, the more that you put faith in that front seat with you everywhere you go. Well, thank you. I mean, yeah, I appreciate you saying that. It, it's, you know, people will sometimes misinterpret what it means to be um, a Christian. And I think they put, they can put their faith in a box and that box is open on Sunday mornings only. Um, But faith, my faith is kind of what drives everything I do and every decision I make. Um, I'm not trying to play golf to make much of me. I'm trying to play golf to make much of the Lord. And um, just recognizing that I've been given a gift to play golf and that's a blessing. That's a gift. Nobody owes me anything. And, why would I want to take a gift and have it only to myself? And so that's, you know, what drives me to um, support ministries and charities and churches and, and, and whatnot. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, a huge part of our family. The biggest thing that's, you know, that represents our family, I would say. And at the Webb Simpson Challenge that you established, golf is important, but so is faith. I mean, you've put it right up there when you talk to those young men uh, that it's it's important to you to make sure that it's God and faith. Yeah, and that's that's been kind of the main, you know, we've had different speakers and different messages every year to try to encourage these guys, but the main message that we've kept kind of throughout the years is trying to let these guys see that um, that golf, or I mean, that God and faith not only can be a part of their golf and everyday lives, but it should be, and um, that it's actually liberating to give your life to the Lord. It's liberating to let him rule over your life. And and it's liberating to try to live for someone else other than yourself. And, you know, we're just trying to communicate to them in a way that I wish, you know, I had been communicated to in high school. Um, so, cause that, you know, these kids, they're dealing with so many different pressures that I dealt with, you dealt with. And so we're trying to, uh, just trying to tell them, Hey, we know what you're going through. But if we could do high school over again, we, we really wish we could have known these few things. And so we have a good time. And, and the tournament's evolved the last eight or nine years. It's, it, it's such a, a fun couple of days now. Can you imagine going to high school now with Instagram, Snapchat, 
Facebook, Twitter. I mean, you deal with it now on a professional level, but can you imagine being in middle school and high school now that what these young men and women have to deal with? No, and that's that's a big a big chunk of time that we spend at my junior tournament is talking through these kind of social media issues and the way you know boys are asking girls out on dates through Facebook and we're saying, hey, pick up the phone, call her. Call her parents, ask them permission. And it's just things have changed a lot in 15 years uh, since I was in high school. And, yeah, I mean, you're right. I think it would have been way harder, uh, you know, going through high school with, with all these social media outlets. Um, I didn't have to deal with that. It was AOL online. You, you get on there and you, you text with people, and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> AOL, boy, there's a blast from the past. Right. Jackson Tyler of Wilmington won it a couple of years ago. Do you try to stay in touch with them? I do. I mean, as much as I can. Um, the, maybe the secret sauce of the junior tournament is the the leaders that we have come, and most of the leaders are college golfers or guys who have just turned pro who um, had played college golf. Those are the, the real kind of feet on the ground, you know, guys who are staying in touch with the high schoolers. And when we break up into small groups at night, we try to put guys together who live near each other. So maybe Wilmington guys or Raleigh guys. And so we also put the the leader of that small group who's going to be in charge of the discussion. um, That leader is going to live near the guys that they're talking to. So there's definitely strategy involved uh, in terms of staying in touch kind of long-term. Your children, the five children that you have uh, as a father, uh, how important is it to you to make sure? It sounds like it sounds like they're with you now. <laughs> yes, they're in another room. It's, how important is it as a father to make sure that they can have some fun on social media and internet? But Webb, the dad, what's he like when it comes to the children and today's society and all the things that kids are dealing with? Well. Dad and I are certainly trying to stay ahead of the game and learn as much as we can from parents who have kids who are ahead of ours. And, you know, they're nice enough to share their failures and, you know, their success is what's worked for them. Um, But we've told our kids from day one, hey, our family's going to do different things than other families. And a lot of times our family um, might have different rules or policies or family values than other families. And we just want you all to know that that's okay. So we just feel like if we're keeping up with the knowledge of what's going on, the research, and our kids know that, hey, our family is going to look different in some ways, then, you know, we're able to kind of implement things now. I mean, even a little change, like we used to have a car with a TV in it, and, um, you know, they got used to watching movies driving around town. Well, we just got a a new car with, and we on purpose got it without a TV and now they don't they don't think anything different. They don't ask for you know a show or a movie because we don't have a TV. So they know they can't really even ask because we don't have one. And we're just seeing how great it is taking car rides now because we're talking, you know, they're reading, they're doing stuff. And so it's just that's been a good lesson for us to see. Hey, you know, if we implement certain things early enough, they'll be used to it. And then, you know, the conversation will, will come. I'm sure about social media and all that but we're not there yet and i think it's it's so cool to hear somebody like yourself who let's face it people see you on tv on saturdays and sundays playing they see you hoisting trophies and 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 all that but you're a dad just like i'm a dad and my news director is a dad and the guy who lives next to you is a dad and you've got these same kind of dad things you deal with every day even when you're out there hitting a a pitching wedge to the 18th green and trying to win a championship. Dad is out there too, not just the player. Yeah. I mean, and that's, I mean, while I'm out there, I'm actually thinking about my kids all the time. I mean, and my kids were at a Honda last week and I'm being dad in the morning, you know, having breakfast with them, go play for eight hours, come back. And, you know, they know I went to work. They know that work is golf, but it's, Golf talk is is non-existent at night in my house unless it's me and my wife. So it's 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 a great it's a great transition for me to leave the course after a good or a bad day and come home to them. 
uh, um, people who have listened to my podcast are pretty sick and tired of me talking about my wife, Sheila. She is the, the rock, and I wouldn't be nearly as successful at what I've done if it wasn't for her because, let's face it, my job is not 9 to 5. I do what I need to do to get the job done here at the TV station every day. And if it was not for her, we wouldn't be as successful as a family. What has Dowd meant to you? Because, let's face it, you go away for days at a time when you're playing. I know she travels with you, but how much of a rock is she to you as a wife and to your family as a mom? I mean, I could spend an, just hours and hours talking about uh, what she means to me and what she means to our family. And, you know, she just she doesn't just allow me to leave, but sends me out. Uh, encouraging me, enjoy rooting for me. Um, I've many times contemplated should I do this anymore because I'm, you know, gone from the kids so much. And she's, you know, given me um, just the blessing of this is where God's called me right now. So I'm going to be faithful where I am right now. And if God leads me somewhere else, then we'll address that when it comes. But uh, I just, I, I can't. You know, I couldn't thank her enough for what she does. I was just gone 10 days, seven in Mexico, three in Florida in a row. And, you know, she's holding down the fort by herself. And, you know, I get a little taste of it if she leaves for an hour or two when I'm home. But I can't imagine being here 10 days, you know, without any help um, from anyone. So she's she loves it. I mean, she um, she wouldn't trade it for anything. And so I'm just so thankful that my kids have her to learn from and, and grow up trying to be like, isn't it great to have that knowledge, though, and that comfort to know that, you know, I, I know I got out over my skis and I, and I married up, and it sounds to me yes. like you believe the same thing. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I joke with her, even though it's true. Uh, in, in college, I didn't try to date her that strongly early on because I really didn't think I had a chance with her, so I played it cool. And I think <laughs> me playing it cool – made her curious about why am I playing the cool and not pursuing her. And I ended up saying that, you know, it was by default. I didn't know what I was doing. So, but it worked. <laughs> and the story is that your dad met her first and, and said he would give her a hundred dollars if she went out on a date with you. Yep. And he paid up, he paid up. He, so our first date together was on my dad. Uh, that is that is such a great story. I absolutely love that story. Uh, I wouldn't be uh, a, a newscaster or a golf fan if I didn't ask you. On the course, you've hit your tee ball. You guys, whoever you're playing with that day, you're walking off the tee box. You're walking on the fairway. What are those conversations like? Are you talking, I got to wash the car when I get home today? Or, hey, look at that guy's <laughs> T-shirt over there. Are, are those just conversations like anybody else has at work? For sure. Uh, we talk about anything and everything. Um, and usually we're talking about anything and everything except golf. Um, but, you know, my caddy is he's one of my best friends in the world. And so um, we've shared a lot of laughs together. We've shared tears together. Um, and, you know, he's that's why he's such a great caddy for me, because he knows me so well personally. And he knows what to say, when to say it, and all that. Um, so I, I owe so, so much of my success uh, to Paul Tesori. And he also is a man who's deep in faith as well, correct? Absolutely. He, uh, he was baptized in 08, started walking with the Lord, and his life has you know, changed since then. And, and his, his wife, Michelle, they got married, I believe it was 2011, and or 2010 maybe and they do great work down in north florida um through their foundation to sorry family foundation so lot, just a amazing family they are a lot of people know your history on the on the tour web and and i'm going to go into it on my digital story the fact that you joined the tour and your first win was at the Wyndham in 2011 and 2012 when you won the u.s open that being one of your big wins uh, you have said afterwards nobody was paying attention to you and you finished and then you ended up winning when uh, when they came out at the end. But then you look at the players last year and you had right. such a huge lead. Your two biggest wins were diametrically opposed. Everybody was watching you versus nobody right. really watching you. What was easier? Um, I would say the U.S. Open was easier. 
I feel like the last day of the players was the longest day and the longest round of my life. Just having a lead that big was slightly uncomfortable. You know, just everybody's chasing you. You're the focus. And if I play halfway decent, I'm going to win. So, and, you know, I weathered the storm. I didn't play great in the kind of middle part of the round, holes 8 through 10, but kind of rebounded with a birdie on 11, and, you know, everybody else calmed down, quit making birdies, which made it easier for me. <laughs> yeah, I, I imagine it, it's, you know, the bullseye was on you for the better part of two days there. I imagine, you know, can you can you share if there were any really nervous times that last day? Um, I would say, you know, I mentioned that stretch eight through eight through 10. That was the only time really all day that I felt really uncomfortable because Tiger's making his run. You know, I'm playing with Danny Lee. He was playing pretty good. That was, I guess, when, you know, I bogeyed eight and I bogeyed 10. So that was the closest I think anyone got to me that day. But, you know, in terms of being nervous, I felt pretty good all day. Um, just, you know, once I weathered that storm 8 through 10, I, I felt pretty good after that, to be honest. Well, I, I know you've, you've been very gracious with your time. I only have a, a couple of other questions here for you. You're a, um, I'm a news anchor and a journalist who wants to be good at golf. You're a pro golfer. What else do you want to be good at other than golf? Great question. Um, so this is a little bit kind of out of left field, but I feel I read a book a couple of years ago called Essentialism. And basically the gist of the book is um, there are a few people who are, or there are some people who are good at a lot of things, but there are a few people who are great at a couple. And people who change the world I'm not really trying to change the world, but, you know, my world are those who are great at a few. And so what the book taught me was um, less is not more, but less is better. And so the people who have the biggest impact while they're living are those who are really, really, really great at whatever God's kind of put in their life. And so I think this day and age, it's easy to get involved in too many things. And you're an inch deep and a mile wide. And so for me, long answer short, or short answer long is um, I, I want to be really faithful at kind of what God's called me to. And right now that's the main focus of that is being a husband and a dad and a friend and a church member uh, besides, you know, my job. So I really want to I really want to get kind of down and dirty with that and and put all my focus and energy as I can right now um, in those areas. And it's easy to kind of get distracted and do other things, but I don't want to uh, because I feel like, um, you know, it'll just hurt my hurt my impact in those areas that I named. So that's kind of what I'm hoping to do. I saw a Team IZOD commercial online where you were hitting golf balls off the back of a boat. <laughs> I, I take it that probably wasn't the first time that happened? Well, I'll tell you what. I was most nervous on that photo shoot because they put the models, the real models, in front of me. And that boat, we had about five foot uh, waves that day. And I said, guys, I can't hit this ball. Like, I'm going to miss it one of these times or shank it, and I'm going to hit one of your models. <laughs> so that was uh, that was an interesting day. But I, I, I do have to say that's the first time I've ever hit a, a golf ball off a boat. Um, I don't want to do it again, though. It wasn't that fun. I figured you probably had done that once or twice in the intercoastal or offshore when you come down to figure yeah. eight. When you want to get away, when you come down to the beach, when you, I know you don't pick up a golf club because you do it for a living, but when Webb wants to get away, what does he do? Read, fish, boat? What can we see Webb Simpson doing when he just doesn't want to care about anything for two hours or so? So I, I love going to Starbucks, having a coffee and reading that's one of my favorite things in the world another one of my favorites you named it getting on the boat cruising around i don't fish much but just cruise around go to wrightsville go to dockside um i love doing that and then other than that i'll be home 
just hanging out with my family, hanging out with my kids. Well, you know, I, I could have made this podcast all about, you know, the Ryder Cup and everything else like that. But I, when I searched, I've seen a lot of articles like that. I don't know if a lot of people have ever gotten really behind the front page of Webb Simpson. And I, I appreciate you allowing me to do that a little bit today. Absolutely, John. Thanks so much. Uh, great questions you asked. And um, I'm a big fan of Wilmington, so look forward to seeing you down the road, I hope. Thank you to Webb Simpson for spending some time with us for this week's podcast. If you'd like to follow him on social media, he's active on Twitter and on Instagram. And if you'd like to take part in the Webb Simpson Golf Tournament for Juniors, go to WebbSimpsonChallenge.com. And keep your eyes peeled. Webb and his family will soon be making that trip back down to the beach. Join us next time when we'll be speaking with Lester Holt of NBC Nightly News. Before we go, I'd like to ask you to please rate and review our podcast. I'd really like to know what you think about it. If you do, you'll really help us with our listing on the podcast apps and help us bring in new listeners. I'm John Evans. Thanks so much for listening to this week's episode of One on One.